Now that we're familiar with the configuration of our summing amplifier, let's take a look at an example. And so as always, I would encourage you to pause the video and maybe try to work through this by yourself first, uh, and then come back and watch the video, see if you got it right. Okay, so for this particular example, we see it has three inputs, just like with our configuration that we considered, and what we're wanting to find is our output voltage and our output current. So find output voltage, which is V out, and output current, which we've not talked about up to this point, um, but we see that's going to be labeled as I out. Okay, so if we want to use our general equations that we got last time, which typically we will because that's going to be easier than starting from our ideal op amp properties and rederiving every time, um, there's, there's nothing technically wrong with doing that, it's just going to take more time to do. So what we can do that might be useful is we can come in here and we can say, well this 20k ohm resistor is in the same place of R1, 10k is where our R2 was, 6k was R3, our 8k is our RF, and then we also have these three voltage sources which correspond to V1, V2, and V3 in our equation. And so sometimes just writing that out explicitly can make it easier to see where to substitute in the various values. Um, so notice we also have this 4K ohm resistor over here on the right that we've not seen before. And so this isn't part of our amplifier configuration, um, but what this 4K ohm resistor is, is our load resistor. So this is our load. And so that could be representing any number of things. Um, any type of simple light uh, or lamp would be a simple, modeled as a simple resistor. Um, components of things like motors could also be modeled as resistors, although like you've maybe seen in previous classes or we'll see in later classes, uh, we'll also have inductive components to consider when we have motors. But at any rate, for now, we're just gonna say that's a 4K load resistor. So all we have to do is we know this is a summing amp configuration, so we just plug these values into that equation we found last time. So we can say our output voltage, V out, is going to be equal to, so it was negative, and then we had V1, which is now 1.5 volts, and we had RF, which is now 8K, divided by 20K, and so in general, it's good to include units, but particularly if you're doing sort of quick work or work for yourself, um, it's okay to leave them out. Uh, you wanna be careful with mixing, for instance, K ohms and ohms, of course. Uh, that's one instance where it can be useful. Or if somebody else is going to be reviewing your work, it's good to include units so that they can easily follow what you're doing. Okay, so that would be our first term for that first voltage and resistor. So then we would move on to our second voltage input V2, which is now two volts and that's multiplied by RF, which is 8K in the circuit, divided by our R2, which is 10K. And then finally, we have one more input, which is 1.2 volts, and that's multiplied by RF, which is still 8K, divided by R3, which is 6K. So let me put some parentheses here, just so everything's the same. And so it's as simple as just plugging that into our calculator. If we plug that in, we get that our V out is negative 3.8 volts. And so it's basically this negative 3.8 is just, of course, again, it's inverting. So we had all positive inputs, so we would expect the output to be negative. And then it's just taking different weights depending on those R1, R2, and R3 values. So if we look, we can see that our V3 is actually given the most weight. And that's because the ratio of RF to R3 is the largest number compared to the other two, which are eight over 10 and eight over 20. Okay, so that's our V naught, so that's pretty straightforward. Now, our I naught we've not dealt with before. So the easiest way oftentimes is to define additional variables to help us get what we're doing. Because if we look at this I naught where it is in the circuit, uh, well, the I naught is going to be splitting, right? Some of it's going through the 8K, some of it's going through the 4K, so we can't use Ohm's law on either one of those to find I naught directly. Uh, we don't have any resistor between our sort of in this area here, so we can't use Ohm's law there. We don't have an explicit relationship for what the output current is based on our input voltages, so let's define some new currents. 
So we said sort of practically, we know that this current is going to be splitting at this node. So we'll have some of it going up this way and some of it going down this way. And let's just call to be consistent with the notes. Let's call this our current IX and this current going down our IY. And so while we're still here labeling things, it's worth mentioning that this V out voltage right here is of course reference to ground. So if we wanted to explicitly write that with polarities, we could say V out is positive at that terminal there where it's labeled and it's negative at ground, which happens to be right there. So we can see that V out is actually the voltage across the load resistor, which is 4K. Okay, so now what about the voltage across that 8K ohm resistor? Well, we know that our non-inverting terminal is grounded, and because VD equals zero, that means that our inverting terminal up here is at a virtual ground. And so of course, virtual ground means there's not a physical path to ground, but the potential there is zero. So if this is a virtual ground, then we know that again, anything on this side over here connected to this node is V naught, and it's a reference to ground. Well, if over here on the left is a virtual ground, then we have V naught like that. Okay, so now we've labeled enough stuff to hopefully be able to easily write this equation. So first of all, we can do a KCL at this node right here, and we see we have I naught coming in and IX and IY coming out. So we can say I naught equals IX plus IY. Well, now we can just use Ohm's law to get those two currents in terms of our V out because we already know our V out value here. So we can see from looking at the top, our V out, or rather our IX in terms of V out is just going to be V naught over 8K. So IX is V out over 8K. And then plus IY, we can see from Ohm's law is just going to be V out divided by 4K. Okay, so then we just plug in our negative 3.8. So we have negative 3.8 divided by 8K. That's a pretty ugly ohm symbol. Let me try again there. And then plus a negative 3.8 divided by 4K. Um, so if you're more comfortable, instead of writing 8K and 4K, you can directly write 8,000 and 4,000. Or we could say we have volts and K ohms which means our current is going to be in milliamps, whatever you're more comfortable with. Um, either way, if you plug this into your calculator, so if we plug this in and we sort of just focus on the numbers, negative 3.88, negative 3.84, what our calculator is gonna tell us is I naught is equal to negative 1.425. Now the units on that, because our units over here our k ohms and volts in both cases, that means that our units for our current are going to be milliamps. Um, because essentially what we can think of that as is we have uh, volts is our base unit, and then we have k ohms, which is 10 to the third. So of course, that's just going to be 10 to the minus third, which is milli. But again, if you're more comfortable, what you can do is just write in 8,000 ohms and 4,000 ohms. Okay, but there's our current I naught. So before we end this example, I just wanna mention really briefly um, sort of a power analysis of this circuit. And so let me just write where this is in the lecture notes, at least at the time of recording this video. And we're not gonna go through all of it, but I just wanna hit the summary. Um, so in the notes, that's on page 3-11. Again, at the time of recording this video, that might change depending on when you're watching this. Okay. So if you're looking through that, basically what we do is we solve for values of currents in all of our resistors. So we've already have IX and IY, but we go ahead and solve for I1, I2, and I3 going through here. And we find that through KCL, our I1, I2, and I3 equals a negative IX like we would expect. And then we looked at our power supplied. So our power supplied is going to be coming from these three sources. Um, because really, remember, we could explicitly write this as, for instance, a voltage source between here and ground. So there's going to be some current going through that, and we're going to have power supplied. Um, so we have power supplied there, and then, of course, we're going to have power dissipated 
in each of our resistors. And, and again, I'll come back and make some corrections to this simplified model here in a little bit, but if we just look at that simple case, what we'll see from our three sources, the power supplied from the sources, and let me put a sum because this is from all of them, is 752.5 microwatts, so a relatively small amount of power. So now if we look at the power consumed in each of those resistors, let's say we have the sum of our power consumed, so that's just the power in each of those resistors, that is equal to 6,167.5 microwatts. Okay, so that, that's kind of weird because we know from conservation of energy that we should have power supplied equals power consumed, but in this case, that's not true. So what's going on? Is, is something wrong here? Or, um, you know, did we do a calculation wrong? And so it turns out that we've not done any calculations wrong, but we, we need to keep in mind that our op amp is actually supplying power itself with that V plus and V minus power supply that we don't usually draw. So our op amp is supplying power as well. And so remember, let me do this in a different color. So remember, let's do brown, we have our V plus and our V minus, which are powering our op amp as well. And then of course, inside the op amp, we have a lot of transistors, resistors, and capacitors. So really, to do this power analysis is a little simplistic without looking inside the op amp, but I just wanted to do it as a reminder that we do have this external power being supplied to our op amp. It's not just power coming from nowhere. Okay, so that's all for our summing amp. In later videos, we're going to continue to look at some different configurations for our op-amp circuits.